God helping me today, I want to lay out the case for God. I want to lay out a case for God to answer many questions of what you have, you've had in your heart. Some of you have these questions in your heart and you've not really identified the questions yet. By the way, uh, poor young lady there, I think you're going to be smothered if he doesn't give you a six inch space there. Poor guy. I pick on teenagers, I really do. And there's a six inch rule, my friend. I'm implementing it today. My Lord have mercy. I wish that every couple in the world could be as much as in love as they express today. Now move over six inches so I can preach. You whispered in her ear to where the hair inside of her ear has wilted. All right. All right. Am I crazy or what? And I say that because I, I, I love to preach and I don't want to be distracted. All right. I want to begin today by praying because this is, by God's grace, I'm hoping that this message will be videoed without the devil messing it up. Because I've seen so many times that God really put something in my heart and the devil screws it up, messes up the recording, messes up the live stream, messes up something. And this message, I want to see this message go to the ends of the earth. I'm, I'm hoping to buy an airplane soon and take this to every single national Christian broadcasting uh, company in America. TBN to 700 Club to everywhere because this message needs to get out. Father, in Jesus' name, cause your anointing to come upon this message. Let nothing distract. Let nothing mess up this message today. Let nothing mess up the recording, the technical end of it. In Jesus' name, I ask you, anoint me. Let me speak like a man from another world. Let the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit exude from my entire being. I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin today by Matthew chapter 12. And uh, I want you to uh, read with me as we, uh, you don't have to read out loud, but I wanted to put it on the big screen. Matthew 12, 34. Jesus is talking to these people uh, Pharisees and talking to these uh, uh, people uh, in his day. And he starts by saying, first of all, make a, make a note of what he says and how he says it. Because the very first words we're going to speak today is from Jesus. This is in the red letters in your Bible. And he starts, he doesn't start this way, but there's too much that he but he really comes against these scribes and Pharisees. Uh, and you can find that in verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So this, the Pharisees were coming against Jesus. And in his discourse, you, you can read it for yourself later, he says in verse 34, O generation of vipers! When I thought Jesus was the loving, kind son of God, and, and he only said pleasant things to people. He called them, he called the scribes and Pharisees, he called them vipers. He called them, he said to them, you're like a whited tomb. You're on the outside really nice and white because people whitewash your tombs with this calcium chalk or whatever they did to make the tombs look really nice and bright and white. But he said, on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. I mean, Jesus came against them. He beat them with a whip when he went to the temple one day. Yeah, at the temple in the public view. He, he, he actually turned over the tables. He could have been arrested for disorderly conduct. and would have been if it was in Hopewell, Virginia. 
But he begins this today. We're going to read, O oh, generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, did he call them evil? Speak good things. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasures, uh, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every outer word that men shall speak, they shall give an account. Therefore, in the day of judgment, he's talking about judgment, talking about people uh, saying evil things. He's saying they're coming from the inside of you. Your evil, your wickedness is from the inside of you. And uh, Jimmy's at a ball game, running down the field. Teenagers, stay with me. Concentrate. This is not a classroom. This is a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room, all right? And so I say unto you that every out of word shall be accounted for. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. And certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would seek a sign from thee. Then he answered them and said, calls them evil again. He says, an evil, an adulteress. Now he's calling them adulterers. An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the, in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Now I, I shared a tidbit of this before, and I'm not going to go into great detail today, but I am going to go into enough detail to, to give you the meat of what I shared in a sermon several weeks ago. Jesus said, there shall no sign be given this generation except the sign of Jonah the prophet. Now, let me say it again. The only sign that Jesus gave to this generation to that generation was the sign of Jonas the prophet, Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the well, even so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so Satan immediately began as fast as he could, and as fast as he could took a hundred years. He, he plotted a hundred-year plan to destroy the essence of the only sign that God gave to that generation. What, what did he do? How did, he, how did Satan plot that? He plotted it with the traditions of men. He plotted it with the Catholic Church. It probably took 300 years to really pull it off. But it was a long-range plan. He knew exactly what he was doing. And it's not the fault of the Catholic Church. It's the fault of the inability for man throughout the Dark Ages to get a hold of the Bible, the real Word of God. And in our day, he's done everything in his power to distort the true Bible that was given to the English-speaking people. And in, that, in this thousand-year plan that he's had, and really it's over the last 150 years that, that this plan has been enacted, he took out the blood as much as he could. And he made preachers start talking about the blood and what the evangelists would talk about, the blood. 
the most important part of salvation, the blood, the world, the Pharisees and the scribes and the intellectual snobbery of our day has deleted the blood because the intellectuals say, this gospel that y'all preach is a bloody gospel. And he made the word bloody in England a curse word. You don't, you don't see that in the good old U.S. of A. But in England, if you say bloody, you're cursing. I'm telling truth here, folks. And what Satan did with the traditions of men that make the word of God, the word of God is made of none effect because of the traditions of men. The traditions of men make the word of God of none effect. That's what Jesus said. And so he made it of none effect by Good Friday. There's no emphasis on Good Friday in the Bible. But we make a roaring success out of it in our day. We market it. It's powerful. It's, uh, he made Friday the day that Christ was crucified. And he was not crucified on Friday. And if you start telling people Jesus Christ was not crucified on Friday, then they get mad at you. Why do they get mad? Because it is one of the biggest deceptions and the biggest cover-ups that Satan has ever used in the history of the world. He had to delete Christ dying on Wednesday. How do you know he died on Wednesday? Because of John 19.31. Go to it. John 19.31, it becomes clear that the Sabbath that Jesus had to be taken off the cross because the Sabbath was coming was not there due to the fact it was on that the Sabbath was Saturday. The Jews, therefore, because it was a preparation that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day, for that, for that Sabbath day, not all Sabbath days, but that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. That Sabbath day, which landed on April the 14th in that year, was not... Uh, a Saturday Sabbath, it was a high day. What high day was that? Passover. And whenever Passover came, Passover did not come on the third Saturday of April or the fourth Saturday of March. It came on April the 14th. How do you know, Pastor Bennett? Because it's my birthday. Thank you for your belated gifts. Send them to 632 Cedar Level Road. Hope well with you. No. Listen, uh, I just turned 68, and in and, and my heart, I'm roaring like a lion today because Satan has destroyed the essence of the Word of God, and thus he has destroyed the power of God in the earth, and he has done everything in his power to destroy everything and to distract us from what is really happening in the world. You say, what does it have to do with anything? It has to do with the fact that 90% of all of you people here and probably 99% of all the people across the world believe that Christ was crucified on Friday destroying the only sign. This is so big that the only sign that God gives a whole generation was successfully distorted and removed from the people in the world because of the traditions of men. If Christ was crucified on Friday, then the words of Jesus is a lie here because you can't get three days and three nights in the heart of the earth from Friday afternoon. 
Is it really important, Pastor Bennett? It's the only sign. If there's only one sign that tells you where to turn and you miss it, Your computer says, recalculating, recalculating. Make the next U-turn as fast as you can. And remember, there's only one sign. If you miss it coming back, then you spend your whole life going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, and you never get on the right road. You never get to your location. You can never figure it out. And you, you, you spin like a top in the world of the spiritual things. You spin like a top because you don't know what's going on because you have not followed the rose petals that Jesus left along the way. It's important. You go share with any of your friends. Jesus really didn't die on uh, Friday. He died on Wednesday. Oh, I don't believe that, they'll say. It's so entrenched in their, in their belief system. They'll fight you over it. The only sign, why, why would the only sign that Jesus, that God chose for this generation, and why is it important that he was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth? Because if he was only there for one night, then it may not be a miracle. If he's there for two nights, it may not be a miracle. But if he's there three days and three nights, it's a miracle. Because after all, you know, I really don't know for sure if the Roman soldiers drained the blood of Jesus or not. They don't believe anything, and they're not going to believe this sign until you explain to them that Jesus Christ had to have been crucified on a Wednesday for him to be in the grave three days and three nights. The people in Nepal, the unsaved people, they believe in mysticism. The Buddhists believe in mysticism. The Indians from India believe in mysticism. And they all have one belief. And the Far East and the Middle East have one belief. A person's not really dead until they're dead for three days and three nights. It's not important to you because you're a dumb American. <laughs> Nothing's important to you. See, our, our, the biggest belief we have today is que salah, salame, whatever will be, big bame. You know. it, the future's not ours to see, que salah, salame. That, that's how we approach life. But that's not how God approaches life. It's not case of loss of law, whatever will be, will be. The future is ours to see. You say, well, where are you headed, Pastor Bennett? Okay, so, okay, so he died on Wednesday. Yeah. Where I'm headed with this is to give you a handle on why we've been here 6,000 years on this planet as, a, as mankind. In the Garden of Eden, God made a perfect man and he made a perfect woman. Perfect. And, just, and before they could have any kids, man and woman messed it up for the whole planet. In the Genesis 3.15, turn to it, Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15, God says to the serpent, I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It will bruise thy head and you will bruise his heel." That is the first scripture on salvation in the Bible. That is the first prophecy that Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, must come. The seed of the woman. And yet, the woman has no seed. It 
So where did the seed of the woman come from? It was the first in vitro fertilization that was ever performed on the planet Earth when Mary was met by an angel, Gabriel, and Gabriel says, you're going to conceive and bear a son. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. Of his kingdom there will be no end. <clears throat> and Satan immediately, from Genesis 3.15, sought out to destroy the seed of the woman. I must destroy the seed of the woman. That happened in Genesis 3.15. In Genesis 6, verse 1, turn to it. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, the daughters were born unto them. Next verse. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Next verse. The Lord said, my spirit will not always strive with man, for he also is flesh, that is, yet his day shall be 120 years. Next verse. And there were giants in the land in those days. Where did the giants come from? Also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, makes it clear, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became men which were of old men of renown. Next verse. And God saw the wickedness of man was great upon the earth and that every imagination of his thoughts were evil, only, only evil continually. He repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I'll destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Jesus said the only sign given this generation is a sign of Jonah. But there's another guy named Noah. Jonah, Noah. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let's find out why. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Uh, I can be perfect if I could be. Uh, I, I know this is going to come as a shock to some of you all, but I have not been perfect in my generation. But God knows I will never have a chance to be perfect in my generations. How many generations are you going to live? There's only one generation I can live in. But Noah is perfect in all his generations. And that word perfect me means pure. And what that means is that his genetic, his seed had not been messed with Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel, and Satan worked immediately to get Cain to destroy Abel, the seed of the woman, or the child of the woman, right? So Abel's gone, and now we got Cain, the murderer. Yes, we got God now. We're messing up God's plan. And so, but Adam and Eve, had another kid named Seth, right? No. Is that right? And so Seth, he goes, uh, I'm going to serve God. And so from Seth to Noah, there had been no intermarriage with fallen angels. Because when the sons of God came down and married the daughters of men, there were giants in the land in those days. And these giants were 10, 12, 15 feet tall. Can you imagine that ceiling is 24 feet from the floor to that arch there is 24 feet. Can you imagine a man so tall that he could stand here and he would be higher than that bar there 
and he could touch the ceiling with his hand. These were men of renown. These were semi-spirited beings. They're called Naphtali. They're called Raphim. And there probably were some that were so messed up, it was unbelievable. Genetically, the animals were messed up. Genetically. God had to bring animals that had not been messed up genetically. But for sure, all of mankind was messed up genetically. And it's all about the genetics of man. It's all about the, pure, the pureness of mankind. Not the perfection, not the spiritual purity, not the spiritual perfection, but the perfection, the, per, the pureness of man from all the way back to Adam. So we have this pureness from Adam all the way to Noah. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Was Noah perfect? No, he, he was perfect in all his generations. But Satan is doing everything in his power to destroy the seed of mankind, the pureness of the seed of mankind. He's got to destroy it. He's got to, that's what the whole thing has been about from the beginning to the end. From the beginning, let me break it down for you. There was a marriage. Man and woman got married and they had children. That's a family. And from John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son there's a father and a son. That's a family. It's all about the seed of the woman now because if we don't destroy the seed of the woman, we're messed up. He's going to bruise our head. We'll never get control of the earth. It's about control. It's about taking over this world. And so we come to Noah's day and the whole world's wiped out except for eight people. Then we go further, and here comes uh, all those diabolical beings are dead now, but the fallen angels are still around. But go with me to 1 Peter. Where is it at, Edwin? Where's Edwin? Huh? Oh, praise God. Bible looker upper. In 1 Peter it says the world that then was. Is uh, Andrew here today? My nephew? Okay, Edwin. The world that then was. I want to bring it up. We're talking about the world that then was. There was a world here that was then. There may have been a pre-Adamic creation. I believe there was. Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. Perished means nothing was living on it. Next verse. But the heavens and the earth which are now. What is he talking about? By the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Be not ignorant of these things, for one day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years as one day. Next verse. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Go to the, with me to the book of Jude. What verse is it? The book of Jude. It talks about these fallen angels. Huh? You see, this whole thing has been about the fallen angels coming and marrying the daughters of men. It happened a couple of times. The book of Jude, what does it talk about? Some of these angels, it says, I think, in First, in first Peter, it says there is, that they are held under chains of darkness. Where's it at? 
Jude 1, 6. Book of Jude 1. And the angels which kept not their first estate. Do you see it? But left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. These fallen angels have a special assignment for judgment. What's it all about? It's all about the seed. We got to destroy the seed of mankind. If we don't if we can destroy the seed, then we can take over this world because if we can make one word of God fall to the ground, we have a legal right to take over the world. Satan knows if one word of God fails, so we, we, we come up to Abraham's day. God says, Abraham, you're going to be uh, in bondage. For, you know, you're going to be in a captivity for 400 years, but I'm going to bring you out of that captivity. And they come out in Egypt. Remember, they came out of, in Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. And they went into this land. They sent some spies in there, and the spies said what? We can't, get, we can't, this place is jacked up over there. We cannot go in there and take these people. We are grasshoppers in their eyes. What happened? I want you to hear this because this is one of the biggest issues of people today against God. If God is a loving God, why did he say kill every man every woman, every boy, every girl, and all the animals. It's simply because there were five cities that were right in the middle of the land that God gave Abraham. Satan saw God say, he said, Abraham, as far as you can see this way, I've given it to you. As far as you can see that way, I've given it to you. And it was the land of Palestine, the Arabs say. It was a certain area over there next to the Mediterranean Sea. And he says, I'm going into the middle of that area, and I'm going to mess up the seed there. I'm going to mess up the genetics there. So they went into this area, and the, the spies came back. It took one, it took two men to carry one cluster's one cluster of grapes. A land flowing with milk. But the genetics were so messed up. The grapes were the size of basketballs or soccer balls. Two men took to carry one cluster of grapes. The genetics were messed up in the land. The genetics were messed up in the people. They're giants in the land. And all of those people and their animals, genetic engineering had been performed on all of those by these men of renown, by these fallen angels that came down that said, we will distort this land and this area and not even God stop us. And the children of Israel overthrew those people one city at a time. The Hittites, the Jebusites, all those ites, in those five cities, not all the cities, but five cities, God said, destroy every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, and all the beasts of the field because they were genetically messed up. Now it makes sense because God is a loving God, and he would not say destroy everything except there was a reason. And the reason for it, there's a scripture in Isaiah that says the Raphaim, which they're Neptalized and Raphaim, they're both giants. There were fallen angels that came down, intermarried into the daughters of men. And there, there's pastors in pulpits all across the world today. They're saying, God said that we would be like the angels. We would not marry nor be given in marriage. That's true. We're going to be like the angels in heaven. You women, thank God for that. You won't have to worry with us men trying to kiss you while we're sitting in church. Huh? So we're, we're, we are... We're not going to marry or be given in marriage in heaven. That's a great thing for you women. Thank God. For us men, we don't know what we're going to do with that, but anyway. It's a great thing. So 
We're not marrying a given in marriage. But angels are male. There's not a single female angel anywhere in the scripture. Those angels do not have the same genetic structure as we have. They have body and soul, but they do not have spirit. The spirit of God does not dwell in them. They're created beings. Very intelligent. Been around for a long time. But they still have their bodies. Where do the demons come from then? It could have been the pre-Adamic creation. When Satan used to rule this world, he was the prince of the powers of the, he is now the prince of the powers of the air, but at one time he may have been the lord of this earth. And he lost his place. I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And the earth became chaotic and all those beings that were made for eternity but did not have a spirit because when God made man, he made him body, soul, and spirit. And a semi-spirited being does not have body, soul, and spirit. They're like your dog has body and soul. I had wrestled with this when I first was in Bible college when I read that a dog has body and soul. It does. He has a soul. He can think a little bit. He, can, uh, he has emotions. He can cry. He can whimper. If you don't believe that, just get a brand new puppy and put him in your house and, and keep the kids away from him overnight. By the second night, you'll have that puppy right there in the bedroom with those kids because he'll, he'll go all these crazy noises all night long. They have soul, but they don't have spirit. And I, I, I'm sorry to tell you, if you see your dog in heaven, it's because God is so gracious to you, he makes one just like your dog, but your dog itself is not going to heaven. Oh, hallelujah. I, people get mad when I say that. Why do you get mad? It's a cat, it's a dog, it's a horse, it's a pig, it's a whatever doesn't have spirit. You can't preach to your dog and he kneels down and say, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. He's not going to tell you that. He's not going to get born again. But my dog's anointed. I know your dog's anointed because you're anointed and, and he is sensitive to the Holy Spirit and that's great. And I, I'm so glad your dog knows the Holy Spirit. Your dog can probably see angels where you can't see them. And that's all fine. God spoke to a donkey, but the donkey didn't go to heaven. Okay, anyway. But we need to understand that from the beginning of time, Satan was on a, a plan to destroy mankind, to keep mankind from being able to inherit eternal life. So much so that when Jesus hung on that cross, he cried, it is finished. And when he said that, the word is titolo, which means we won. He snuck up on the devil. Because 1 Corinthians says, had the princes of this world known, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. Why would they have never crucified him? Because if they had not crucified him, if the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes were healed. If that had not been fulfilled, if Isaiah 53 had not been fulfilled, then Jesus would not have been able to redeem mankind. His blood had to be shed, and he had to go to heaven and sprinkle his blood on the mercy seat of heaven. And from that day, when man did not accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, as the Messiah, as the, as the Messiah of God, went into the curse, which all of the flamboyant writers of our day have called the age of grace. It's the age of the curse. They write, it is the... Uh, the church age. No, it's the age of the curse. Let me show it to you. Malachi, the last two verses of Malachi. 
for that coming of that great and day. Okay, let's do this one. They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I'll spare them as a son, as a man's own son that serveth him. That's talking about the rapture right there. Next verse. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Next verse. Behold, there you go. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of that great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Jesus did not turn the heart. I mean, Elijah did not turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, the heart of the children to their fathers. Didn't do it. Wasn't able to do it. Elijah was John the Baptist. Jesus said, John the Baptist is Elias if you can receive it. But they didn't receive it. And so the earth was smitten with a curse. You can't call it anything but a curse. When we go into the dark ages, the Catholic Church hides the word of God. Oh yeah, doesn't let it be taken away, just hides it in monasteries everywhere. The word of God was hidden. They had their church services in Latin, so the people would sit there and go, uh, they could not contact God because they could not contact the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And when somebody's speaking to you in Latin and you don't know a thing they're saying, the priests were so distorted and so perverted, they were all part of this plan. Satan blinded the eyes of people everywhere, even to the point that when Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther got a hold of the, the message, the just shall live by faith. And he tacks it onto the door of that church over there. Germany, he thought the Jews are going to receive it. The Jews are going to embrace it. Jesus is coming soon. And when the Jews did not receive it, he turned against the Jews, and the last writings of Martin Luther were these type of writings, very bitter against the Jews. He said all the Jews' houses should be burned to the ground and dung should be piled up on their houses 20 feet high. He called the Jews Christ killers, the man that gave us the Reformation, that brought us out of the Dark Ages, was the same man that cursed the Jews. Because he didn't understand why this revelation of God, the just shall live, it burned a hole in him. It, it became the greatest thing that he had ever learned from the Word of God. He broke away from the Catholic Church, but he could not break away from the bitterness because God didn't do what to do when he thought God should do it. Habakkuk 2.4 Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. That verse brought us out of the dark ages in increments. That was in the 1600s, I believe. And when that happened, it's still, what are we in today? The 1900s, the last of the 1900s, the first of the 2000s. I said 1900 because when you say 2000, people get really confused. But it's been 6,000 years. Remember, a thousand years is as a day. A day is as a thousand years. There were six years of creation. And then on the seventh day, God rested. There's 6,000 years to the Jewish calendar is something like, I don't know what it is, 5778. So it's not 6,000 yet. But it really is 6,000 because their calendar is only so many days in a year. So they miss five days out of every year. Anyway, it's all very complicated. Satan has obscured everything that he could. Remember? He made it so that everybody on the planet believes that Jesus Christ was crucified on Friday, thereby negating three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. 
let's just negate the word of God. Is anybody still here? And so what's happening today? Today. There's a curse that's going, getting ready to go over the face of the whole earth. Found in the book of Zechariah, chapter 5. Zechariah, chapter 5, the angel says, uh, what do you see here? He says, uh, he turned and lifted up his eyes and looked and behold a flying roll. And in the Hebrew it says a flying scroll. And he said unto me, what seest thou? And I answered, I said, I see a flying roll. What's the length of it? 20 cubits. You know what 20 cubits is? 30 feet. 30 feet. You know what the size of this building is? 60 feet wide. So from here to the wall, here to the three feet past the wall, is 30 feet. And how wide is it? It says it's 10 cubits. What's that? 15 feet wide. So it's 15 feet from the front row to about right here. It's this to the wall. And it's a round circle. Flying roll. It's a flying scroll. We know what a scroll is. And if it's a flying scroll, then it must have wings. So if you take that thing and sit it upright, let's sit it upright. To the top of the ceiling is 24 feet. So it's uh, six feet beyond the top of the ceiling, and it's as, about as wide as that road, the two edges of the row. Can you picture something, a big tube, 15 feet wide, 30 feet tall? Now, Go with me for a moment. Watch carefully as I draw you a picture. On the side of this flying scroll is two wings. You go out, you make a big square piece like that. On this side, that's one wing. You make a big, you go out this side of it. You make a big triangular thing, looks like a wing on this side. And you look and you see. He didn't see it had solar panels. He did not see. It just looked like a flying, a scroll that's flying. Got two wings on it. Yeah? You know what it was? He was looking at a satellite. It's as clear as can be in my mind. Some people, I, most everybody I share with this with, they say, my God, that's, that's what, it, what's, what it must be. And he says to me after he asked me how big it was and made me describe it, he says, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that stealeth would be cut off by this satellite. These satellites. And everyone that sweareth shall be cut off on that side according to it. So I assert to you today, there's a new contest in town. The contest is, if you look at anything to do with the news, every single day there's an article on genetics, genetic modification. How can we heal people's hearts now? It's real simple. We inject a genetic thing around the heart area and it fixes the heart. It fixes the genes around the heart. All of these UFO abductions all have to do with Reproductive organs of cows. I don't know why cows, but also of humans. They do research on these humans. If, if, if you've got a thousand people sharing the same thing that taken up by UFO and they were researching me, could it be that Satan is trying everything in his power to be able to figure out how that he can go into a woman's uterus and be born or have a being born that's not a giant because it's going to be difficult for him to sell himself that he, the whole world should worship him and the whole world should follow him and the whole world should take the mark of, his, of the beast if he's 18 feet tall. It's a little difficult to sell that. But if he can become Antichrist incarnate, if he can find a body that he can 
go into and maneuver and the body be blank. So maybe we'll clone a human being. And if I can get into him and give him intelligence, then I can be the Antichrist on the earth. He's got to fake Christ. He's got to fake the virgin. He's got to fake Christ every way he can. He's the Antichrist, the antithesis of Christ. And then I can say, you cannot buy, you cannot sell unless you take this chip. And when you put the chip in the person, they no longer are just human. They become human and spirit. They become human looking animals. We've been programmed for the zombies. You will literally become a zombie, but not, you won't act like a zombie. You'll be able to function. You'll be able to buy. You'll be able to sell. When that chip goes in you, we know exactly where you are. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We know what you say for four weeks at a time or four months or four years is recording everything you say so that the police roll up and say, we suspect that chip number 4268596 was in the 7-Eleven when it was robbed. And you hold out your hand and say, I was not there. Check it for yourself. You start running down the road. Now they got proof. They don't need your genes. They don't need anything because they got your voice in the 7 Eleven saying, Don't shoot him, Charlie. <laughs> they know where you were. They know what you were doing. They have your voice. You testify by, against yourself. By your words, you're justified. By your words, you're condemned. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They were marrying and they were given in marriage. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They were marrying, they're given in marriage. What's going to happen on this planet? On this planet. He that letteth, he that hinders will hinder till he's taken out of the way. Jesus is coming soon. We're going to go up in the rapture. And then Satan can take the rest of the people on this planet and make it so that none of them can buy or sell. The genetics are going to be messed up again. That's his plan. Because he wants to rule the world. And he's going to have a one world order. He's going to have a new age movement. It's all about that. And you know why it's all about that? Because from the beginning, it was a wedding. Revelations chapter 22, 21 and 22 says, I'll come with me and measure. Let me show you the, the bride of Christ. And he takes me and shows me the new Jerusalem and says, measure that. That is the bride of Christ. The new Jerusalem coming out of God out of heaven. It's all about a wedding. There's going to be a wedding. God is trying to replace the one-third angels that fell with the bride of Christ. And that gives you a handle on what's happened for the last 6,000 years. And Satan has tried every way he could to destroy humanity and make it so it's not just human. Jesus said, you must be born of the water and of the spirit. And if you're born from a woman's womb, you're halfway there. But if you're a Neptali, if you're 15 feet tall, you can't be born of the spirit because there's no spirit in the Neptali to contact the spirit of God. You cannot be born again. When you take that mark of the beast, there is no turning back. You cannot dig it out and repent. For everyone that takes that mark is assigned to hell. You have nothing to lose. You will turn over your mother and your father, your brothers and your sisters. 
the closer it gets to that day when your heart becomes perverted. They're testing this mark. They're testing these, these chips right now. They're trying to change people's genetics. It's all about the genetics. It's all about the genes because Satan cannot rule the world unless he can get a hold of your genes. It's the only way he can make you follow. We're brainwashing our kids now. They're getting out of school every single month to go do another demonstration against guns. What kind of craziness is that? My gun got up the other night, came out of my closet, choked, started choking me. <laughs> then it pointed itself right at me. And I said, I surrender, I surrender, because I knew my gun was going to shoot me. And I started looking at my boxes that we get from Amazon. And I thought to myself, my God, this, these boxes, they're dangerous. They may give me a paper cut. I may bleed to death. Or there may be a bomb in one of them. Oh, what about a... Could be plastics made out of the bottom, set to go off. And my TV set. I sit there in fear as I watch Fox News because I know they're looking at me. My God have mercy, folks. We are hindering the devil. We're hindering the devil. You're doing a good job. But when you're taken out of the way, the genes of this world will one more time be tried, tried to be totally destroyed. And yet in the midst of all that, there's going to be tens of thousands of people refusing to take the mark. And Satan's going to go nuts trying to hunt you down. So if you missed the rapture because you really don't want to be ready yet, but you know too much truth and you're not going to take the mark, there's some charts here. It'll tell you all about what's going to happen. Get those charts. Hide them in your basement. Only let certain people come in and look at them. Resist uh, the Antichrist. Do everything in your power to become killed by him because then you can go at least and go underneath the altar of God. And then for the next seven years, you can start screaming, How long, oh Lord, do we have to stand underneath this altar? That's what it says is going to happen in the book of Revelation. It's all going to happen the way God said it. But all your friends and relatives, if you don't make it in the rapture, your friends and relatives, don't trust any of them. If they took that chip, they are your mortal enemies because they can never be saved. It's not that they committed the unpardonable sin. It's they took the chip and they're no longer just human. And only God's only interested in the human race. For he so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Father, thank you for helping me explain some of these things today. And I ask you, Lord, don't let us be so crazy as to not make it in the rapture. Help us not to be deceived for if it were possible the very elect would be deceived Lord every person that doesn't make it in the rapture they have been deceived and I ask you you will help this church to go up together that we would see you face to face in Jesus name Amen all right Every head bowed and every eye closed. If Satan did everything in his power to destroy the genetics of the world in Noah's day, if he did everything he could to destroy the genetics in the children of Israel's area, if he's doing everything in his power to put a chip in every person in this place, as soon as he can why would you not want to serve Jesus now if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior I want you to raise your hand I don't want to have to beg you to accept Jesus into your heart 
When you do not accept an invitation like this, you reject it. You're rejecting it. I'm ask one more time. If you're here today, you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, raise your right hand and say, Jesus, come into my heart. I've given the call. It's as simple as this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and you believe in your heart, God raised it from the dead. God, God's word says you are saved. So I ask you today, don't go to sleep tonight without accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Don't be left behind.